I'm Linda Ignatz, and I'm the Global Sale of My Literacy Executive Director. So welcome to Global Cred, and welcome to this session, Game Changer, How the Seal of My Literacy Benefits Academic Programs. So this session is really about how the Seal of My Literacy can impact your school district and your world language programs, but also impact those learners and the opportunities and benefits that um, they will have in the future. So I'd really like to begin the session with an introduction to the Seal of Biliteracy. First of all, just as a definition, it's a recognition awarded to certify language skills in two or more languages. For me, um, it began uh, way back in 2013, really late 2012, and as a language educator, as a Spanish teacher in a classroom, I saw it as something that really would engage my students and excite them about not just sitting in a classroom and, and sort of sitting there for seat time to kind of fulfill a language requisite, but really to engage in the learning process and get excited about um, the language course for lang the, you know, to be able to actually gain language proficiency. And I wrote an article for Education Week about how I saw the seal of my literacy as a game changer. And I believe that that's still the case today. And I'll tell you why. So first of all, it does represent um, an acad you know, sort of proof of language proficiency. And as a document, as a certificate, it holds more value than a test score to an employer or an academic institution that may not know how to interpret that test score. So really what we're looking at is um, a way for a language learner to articulate a skill that they have. Because in most cases, the state seal, as well as our global seal, the level is determined via testing and it's aligned to the actual proficiency scale. Now that's important because I remember one of my own students said that when he told his boss that he'd gotten a four on the AP test, his boss said, well, that's nice because that four didn't really mean much to him. But when he told him that he was going to get a state seal of biliteracy, his boss said, wow, you must be really good at language and gave him a raise. In the United States, um, the state seals, as well as the global seal, in most cases, one of those languages must be English. The only exception is the state of Hawaii, which is officially a two language um, bilingual state. And again, as I mentioned, these are all based on the actual proficiency scale, which I'll describe in a little more detail later. When we talk about the idea of biliteracy, what we're talking about is two languages, and we're not talking about bilingual, which is communicative, speaking and listening. We're really talking about biliterate, which also brings in the component of literacy, of reading and writing. There are some states that actually refer to their state seal or certificate, or in some cases it's called an endorsement, um, as multiliterate or multilingual. For example, I live in Illinois. We have a state seal of biliteracy. The neighboring state of Indiana has a what they refer to as a certificate of multilingual competency. So it depends on where you are. The seals of biliteracy then really can um, enable us to use literally gamification to engage learners because it becomes something that they strive for, that they want. And players, just like a video game player, um, they begin to take autonomy. It's competition against the game, against their, their own outcomes. And they begin to take um, ownership of their language learning journey and their pathway in order to meet personal goals that they see valuable, which is how can I leverage my skills for the future? There's also a paradigm shift. In the past, language learning was often, often something that a student would take two years because they saw it as a prerequisite for college admission. So the only reason for taking it was to get a check off as a, as a college admission requirement, and all they needed was to pass the course. So there was no sense of working to get a good grade or working to learn the language, but just working to get by. And so what we've changed with the seal of biliteracy is a student now comes into the course 
at the beginning with a longer sequence in mind and proficiency in mind because they know at the end of the sequence there's a test to determine whether or not they've achieved the level required for this certificate and for a credential that can actually be used in the workforce. So that's pretty exciting. And that brings me to the next point, which is the seal of biliteracy isn't like a trophy. It, it is certainly an honor and it is a kind of award, but more importantly, it is a certificate, a credential, a micro-credential that can be used as a tool to leverage their skills for future opportunities. It is a kind of license or certificate that a student can use to measure their skills for the workforce. And it in many cases offers a tiered certification. There are certainly some states that um, have more than one level. The Global Seal has three levels of certification, but it also provides learners because of the tiered uh, actful proficiency cone um, benchmark testing allows them to see where they are along this, that sort of pathway to proficiency so that they can continue to level up. Again, that idea of gamification. And there are certainly benefits to academic programs. And we're gonna talk about a number of those, but retention, um, program efficacy, and the best one, is great visibility to your, for your school district. So let's talk about some of the basics and we'll start with the state seals of biliteracy. Uh, 40 states have a state seal of biliteracy. And as I mentioned, they um, are different. In fact, it, not only do they look different <laughs> as you can see here by these examples, but they have different names and they have different rules and regulations. But in most cases, what they do have in common is they're awarded to seniors in their senior year, oftentimes either at graduation or in senior honor programs shortly before. There are some states that allow the award to be provided earlier or earned earlier through testing uh, prior to graduation. To uh, provide the state seal of biliteracy, a school district often has to either apply to the state um, sometimes um, assign an administrator to um, um, supervise the program. Sometimes in some states, the student themselves actually apply to the state. There might be recognition and or testing costs included. Also for the state seals of biliteracy, the schools must meet the state uh, requirements to participate. In some states, uh, public schools only are allowed. Um, in other states, there are uh, availabilities for all schools or all students to participate. In most cases, again, we mentioned it is just something awarded to seniors in high school. Um, and there are varied tiers of play. In other words, each state will determine what its levels are and what criteria is required, what tests are approved, uh, whether there are options for uh, languages that may not have um, as many tests available to them, and so on. The global seal of biliteracy is a little bit different, but was born from the same concept um, in that it was a recognition um, that was going to measure language proficiency. But what was different was it tried to fill the gaps and has since expanded um, to fill even more. <laughs> and the very first gap was that it, the state seals were only open to students in public schools who had opted to participate. So if a school student was in a school that wasn't participating, they didn't have an opportunity and were really disenfranchised from a state seal of biliteracy, even though they had bilingual skills. And so the global seal of biliteracy became an opportunity for anyone anywhere that could demonstrate the skills. This also became a possibility for college students who previously had no opportunity, but yet actually had more, uh, could gain more value from having a certificate because they're about ready to enter the workforce. And so that would be even more important for them to have that on the resume. It also is valuable to students who are in dual language programs or heritage learners who may have a heritage language or go to a heritage language school that does, um, and, and have a language that might not be offered in the school district itself. They still need two language skills and um, they still need to take a test 
And the test, um, unlike the state seals, which differ from state to state, um, there is a consistency of the rules globally for the states, uh, for the global seal of biliteracy. And we have three tiers of play that are consistent, again, globally. We call them functional fluency, working fluency, and professional fluency. This is what it looks like if we were to graph it out on um, that actual sort of, um, scale of proficiency levels. So you'll see that there are um, most of the states that will line up under that actual level of intermediate mid, which is also the Global SEAL's first level called functional fluency. There are also some states that have a number one and a number two. That means that those states actually offer two tiers, a silver and a gold, a bronze, and maybe a platinum. There are some states that do have uh, more than one way of achieving a seal. It might be through testing, but it might also be uh, through seat time, through um, maintaining a GPA or taking um, a portfolio or some other kind of option. And you see those listed on the left. And so what we see is a great diversity, which provides obviously a challenge for universities who can't um, across the country provide the same amount of credit because the student coming with a state seal um, from one state may not have the actual same skill and level of proficiency as a student coming with a state seal from a different state. And so obviously that poses a little bit of a challenge for universities that might want to provide placement or advanced college credit for students with these awards. If you want to learn more about your state seal of biliteracy, theglobalseal.com has a great bank of state resources and research on the state seals of biliteracy available. There's an interactive map where you would select your state, a state seal page would open up that has information about that particular state seal, including its artwork, um, the state law, if it's available, or school code. It also has a list of the common tests that are accepted by that state SEAL program, links to those test companies, as well as an actual website link to the Department of Education page and more. There's also a link to um, pages, a page with all of the different languages if you're looking for a test by language. So if we look at this sort of uh, summary of where are those state seals? We now have 40 states that have a state seal program. And most of the states without a program currently have one either in the works or under consideration. The global seal similarly is in almost every state. We have 42 states and several others where, in fact, every other, where there has been an application um, either made or one that is in process. Additionally, we've issued global seals in Mexico and Japan and have applications in some other countries that are in process. And so when we look at the seal of biliteracy, the big question is why? And for me, it's because it motivated learners. It was what engaged students to do more than just get by and do the minimums. If we look at the, um, this chart, this comes from an article research that was done in my state of Illinois in three different school districts. It was published in the foreign language annals. And the question was posed about, what do you feel about the benefit to a state seal of biliteracy? And this question was asked of students who were enrolled in language, who had left language courses, who had never enrolled in language, as well as English language learners. And about 85% of students felt that it would help them with future employment opportunities and future careers. Some thought about 75% thought it would help them with college credit. Only a few valued it for better grades. In fact, students by and large saw the connection with the SEAL as a language credential for the future and the far future, not the immediate future. Um, I like the, the quote from this student who said that for him, he thought he saw it as an opportunity for scholarships and decided, well, I guess I'm gonna get the seal of biliteracy and committed that on, be, based on the hope of a scholarship. And that's exactly what we see students doing, that the work is 
easy or worthwhile because it has a long-term value. And so other reasons why students might want a seal of biliteracy is because credentials really do matter because they want early admission, uh, they want to stand out or distinguish themselves on college applications, maybe a job resume or CV. They want advanced placement so that they can maybe add an additional minor or fit in a study abroad program, double major perhaps. They want um, to quantify their skills. And so all of these are really important things that the global seal or state seal of biliteracy can do quite easily. These are just a few examples of how students have leveraged their language skills through a document. One of them is Taylor Doyle, and she used um, her state seal of biliteracy in Spanish to distinguish herself. She used it to get scholarships. She used it to enter into a um, uh, two different internship programs um, to work with two different NGOs and to um, actually apply for <laughs> and, uh, a leadership program. We also see Annabella who used her two different global seals, one in Chinese and one in Spanish, um, to get early admission to Cornell University. Austin used his global seal functional fluency in Spanish to get accepted to um, and to receive a scholarship from Michigan State University. And Georgia got advanced placement with her working fluency global seal in Japanese. And so in each of these cases, the students felt that it was their global seal that made the difference. We also have seen through the research and the data, again in the study that was um, from published in the Foreign Language Annals, that when you have a seal of biliteracy program, that the enrollment in world language programs increases, um, as does retention. In fact, retention over the course of two years in advanced placement programs doubles. That's pretty exciting because a lot of these programs have been declining in recent years. One of the students in the study said, well, it gives you a motive to finish. Before I was like, why am I in this class? And we see these same kinds of growth retention numbers across all languages. So if we look at that piece, what's the value in having increased AP numbers? Because those advanced placement tests actually impact other areas besides your world language department. AP enrollment increases impact the U.S. News and World Report high school rankings because they impact or are a part of the measurement for your college readiness index as well as the college curriculum breadth index or how ready your students are for college. We also see because the seal of biliteracy and advanced placement and college readiness opportunities, um, or the idea of having college, um, advanced placement becomes an opportunity for English language learners if there's a second language that they can take the seal of biliteracy or competency-based credit in, that that actually increases the underserved populations as well. Those pieces also impact what's called your state school report card because We've seen that when you can provide credit, um, that increases your graduation rates, it closes the gap for those underserved students, and it helps prepare them for college and careers. Lastly, those numbers, including your state school report card, impact your home values. According to the National Association of Realtors, almost half of home buyers in ages that age 30 to 39 make their home buying decision based on a school report card. So my advice, adopt a school state seal of biliteracy or the global seal of biliteracy and your home values will go up. Another example of we see at the college and the university level is that it impacts not just high school programs, but also university programs. Sonoma State did a, sort of an experiment uh, with advanced placement and decided to offer an equivalency piece with advanced placement scores to primarily their Spanish-speaking students. And they took a risk. 
a lot of people were afraid that you know they would lose money uh, by giving away so much college credit. But what they found was that actually they increased by a pro, um, by providing students that had those high AP scores with 16 credits, putting them into their third year, their junior year, their fifth semester, that the number of majors increased by 40%. The number of minors in the language doubled. And among this high risk population, there was a 16% increase in their four-year graduation rate. And you see the numbers there on the side. So it really impacted the success of students who otherwise might not have finished school. We see this across the country um, in that there is national support for the state seals of biliteracy as we see larger and uh, growing numbers, not just of our English language learning populations, but that we also see this, the seals of biliteracy as a way to sustain and maintain heritage languages, which have oftentimes been critical to um, our national defense, as well as to commerce and the growth of the economy. And so we see at the national level um, legislation and um, programs that have been developed such as dual language programs and others to support the sustaining of a language that was begun and learned at home, as well as the acquisition and improvement of English languages. That is all demonstrated and um, documented in an article, a journal a study published by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences called America's Languages. And one of its key recommendations was that college course credit, rather, um, be offered for proficiency in a heritage language. That, um, so that students that have a heritage language be afforded um, the same credit that a student might get if they're taking that language um, in, in a high school classroom. This makes it really um, a powerful tool for a student who might otherwise be spending more time in an English classroom setting so that they not only can uh, graduate with the appropriate amount of credit, but have their home language honored and valued as a bilingual, and then also leverage that opportunity for the future. And here's a little bit you know, of the impact of those particular students. We see in large quantities in my state, for example, there are almost one fourth of the population of Illinois has another language that's being spoken at home. And this gives them a motivation to maintain that language rather than to forget it. We also see that colleges can go global. So we see students at the university level find it even more valuable to earn a global seal of biliteracy that they can add to a resume, to a CV, or to their LinkedIn profile because there is a definite connection between language skills and the workplace. And when we make that connection by proficiency level, it becomes very clear to students. Oftentimes a student feels like it's an all or nothing, but there are levels of language required for different kinds of jobs. For example, our functional fluency at the intermediate mid-level um, is someone who can do some routine tasks, some repetitive, um, very expected, um, highly uh, um, uh, repetitive sort of tasks, simple conversations, such as a receptionist, uh, someone that is a, very predictable. Um, they're going to help someone fill out forms. They're going to maybe be a banker. They're going to uh, do something in a store context of sales where they're providing similar directions on a daily basis. Those are all things that could be easily done by someone with this level of skill. At our working fluency level, it could be someone who's actually has the skill set to become a language educator. They could also do nursing, for example. We found um, with the, you know, in this past COVID crisis that that's been an important area um, they could handle 911 calls in the language, a customer service representative where they could find out what was the problem 
uh, with a product or with a service. And then we also have that higher advanced high level where more language skills and more technical skills and academic knowledge um, are required. But all of those pieces, whatever that level is, could be entered and articulated um, with, for example, the global seal, where we add a serial number to the actual tool um, certificate. And it now becomes not just an award, but an actual tool that becomes a license or certification that the student can enter in on a LinkedIn profile. And this makes it very marketable and an easy way for them to articulate their skill. Because there are things like pay differentials or bilingual pay available, but only if you can document what you're able to do. This is an example of what's available for our students. So for in this is from ZipRecruiter, um, a $70,000 average pay um, annual salary for a nurse. And the American Nursing Association said that there's an average national pay differential of about 7% if someone is bilingual. So according to ZipRecruiter, I thought, well, that might be a little bit more, but they actually said that the average national salary last year was $85,000 for a bilingual nurse. It's a considerably amount different. So in this case, working fluency really would pay off. The Global Seal of Biliteracy is also beneficial to educators. Uh, an educator um, sometimes <laughs> needs to refresh their own skills. Um, it also gives them an opportunity to experience the testing uh, experience itself and know what does it like. Um, oftentimes, they haven't um, been doing academic writing. They have, um, you know, they're working on keeping their language simple enough to be understood by their students and they could lose some of their own skill set. So this is a great opportunity and great way to honor your language teachers by providing them with their own credentials. It's also a way if you have international teachers um, to ensure your parents that they have a good and quality and uh, documented uh, skills in the English language if you're concerned that they might not be able to communicate with parents. It's also a way to pre-screen and hire new teachers. So where are you on the scale? It's always a question of the path toward proficiency. It's not a, a pass or a fail. It is just a process. And that's the most important piece to help students kind of understand. And so I kind of, we take that actful cone with its five levels from novice to intermediate to advanced, superior, and distinguished, we look at those three lower levels where our uh, kindergarten through uh, the university level tend to fall. Those three bottom levels are broken up into three sub-levels. And I like to think about them in, the same, in something that's more tangible and, and uh, a metaphor for transportation, we'll say. And so if we take that little baby at novice low and they're crawling, that's how they're getting around on their hands and knees and they require a lot of excitement and everything they do is it's not really tangibly very much. It's a little tiny movement or a little word or a little sound like da, da, a syllable and everyone's over the moon and overjoyed and excited. And then as they, they have a, acquire a little bit more skill and a little bit <laughs> more balance, they're starting, you know, maybe with that little walker and they're very much supported, but they're sure they're doing it on their own. And again, they're, we're, we're very excited for them. Um, then they move to that tricycle and each step is moving toward independence in the language. They're doing more. The same thing is true for our language learners as they move into that intermediate range where it's not repetitive and it's not sort of copycat of what I see with lots of support, but rather it's what I can do on my own for my own purposes, and I'm independently doing it. I'm functioning on my own, maybe a little wobbly, maybe with support. Uh, maybe I can do it on my own, but there's just, unless I hit a bump in the road, I'm pretty good. It's taking me more and more practice, but I'm getting there. And 
I'm almost to the place where I can, you know, be an adult and I have my, my learner's permit and I can drive that car. I'm almost into that sort of working space. And then here I am at advanced low and I am working as a driver. I have a professional use of my language skills. And then our advanced high, our professional fluency um, award um, for the Global Seal is um, sort of my dream. Um, this is Julia Zhang. She is a chief engineer for the Karma uh, Car Company. It's a pretty cool high-end luxury car. But she has language skills in Chinese and English that are highly technical and highly proficient. And so we start to see where that journey takes us. And each step of the way has its usefulness. And there's always another space to strive for. And that's really what we want our students to do. In fact, with the Global Seal, they can earn each one of those levels along the way. And that's the beauty of benchmark testing, is that as soon as they have skills, if they're in a dual language program or a heritage learner, they might, or in a in middle school program or, a, you know, or have... Um, a study abroad experience, they might be able to test sooner. They might be able to acquire something sooner. And they can actually then give them an incentive um, to level up instead of, oh, well, I've already got it and I'm done. And so we want to continue to dangle the carrot of ongoing language learning. And so we can do that through benchmark testing. And we have found that benchmark testing is an incredibly powerful way to gamify the language learning process by providing students not just feedback, but, but autonomy over their own process of learning. And so on the globalseal.com website under learn more, you'll find our language test chart and a list of our qualifying tests and what scores are required uh, for which level of certificate. We offer tests in over a hundred different languages um, we don't test, I should say, we approve a qualifying test in over 100 different languages. But there's a link to each of these test companies, and you can choose the test company that you'd like to use and then um, submit scores to us for verification and for certification. If you need help finding a test, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a page that looks like this. You'll find your the language and click on the language and it will take you to a page that shows the different languages, uh, language tests that are available for you to take in that particular language. Again, there's lots of different languages available. A proficiency test is gonna measure the comprehension of the language, what the learner understands. It's going to measure both their listening and their reading comprehension, as well as their production of the language what they're able to create on their own. This is not a multiple choice test. It's not a fill in the blank test. It's actually a sort of open-ended test measure to find out how complete they can write, how well they write. Are there transitions? Are there sentences supported? Is it um, you know, short sentences or is it complex sentences or sentences that are connected uh, with the beginning, a middle, and an end um, in paragraph form? And the same thing is true for their speaking. And all of these tests currently are all correlated and rated according to the ACTFL scale. Beginning in January 2021, we'll begin to also take tests that are core, um, a, a set of qualifying tests that are correlated to the Council of Europe's CEFR scales as well. So when we think about that idea of leveling up and gamification, test scores that are form an individual report that provides information and feedback in all four test areas or all four skill areas are really powerful. You'll see from these two examples, one from the Apple test, one from the Stamp 4S test, that the student has a different score in reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And that's that's very, very typical. It's really normal. We all have our strengths and we all have our weaknesses. If I'm shy, I might be able to write better than I speak. If I have um, 
a Spanish speaking grandmother, maybe my Spanish listening skills are really better um, than my reading skills. And so it just depends on my experience and um, my practice and what I bring to the table. And it's important for students to know that because what happens is that oftentimes their best score is two sub levels on the actual scale higher than their lowest score. So when, by the time they reach all four levels, all four skills um, at the criteria for a certificate, and they might already be at the next certificate level in one or more of their skills. And so they don't see themselves at the lower level. They see themselves at the next certificate level. Instead of being functionally fluent, they see themselves as working fluency, except in that one area they have to work on. And it gives them, an ex again, that sort of drive and motivation to level up and figure out the game. So that power in benchmark testing is incredibly huge. In Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico, they tested from one year to the next, 11% of the students leveled up and went from the functional fluency at intermediate mid to working fluency at advanced low in one year. Again, they might've been at the middle area, maybe they were intermediate high, but that's exciting because students start to begin to pay attention and they ask like, what are my scores? What do I have to do? to get better? What do I have to do to improve? Another group that really is impacted by benchmark testing and by having an opportunity to get a seal of biliteracy are our English language learners. In fact, there was a study done in Washington State funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that found that if we can provide competency-based world language credits through testing for these students, that it may in fact, in this case, impacted 21% of them needed those credits to graduate from high school. 10% needed language credits to be qualified to go to a four-year college. And one third of them were Spanish heritage language learners. The city of Chicago has done an incredible job of providing opportunities for their heritage learners to get the state seals of biliteracy. In fact, two thirds of their seal of biliteracy awardees are either current in this last year, are current or former English language learners from the class of 2018. It was amazing. And you can see the growth, but the reason why they changed those numbers from 2015 to the huge jump in 2016 and 17 is because they began to do benchmark testing and benchmark ceremony awards. They're letting students know early where they are on the pathway and what it is that they need to do to improve. And it is that information and feedback that provides students the autonomy as well as the information to change their pathway. And that's what the research told us in the foreign language annals study, was that parents and students needed to know earlier about the opportunity. In fact, that was one of the barriers. They felt that they didn't know about the seal until it was too late. And that meant that they might have already dropped out of the class or not taken a language at all and felt like they had missed out on an important opportunity for their future. It's important to inform the stakeholders outside of just the world language classrooms or the English language rooms about the seal of biliteracy. For example, your coaches need to know that four years of world language count as division one academic eligibility for NCAA athletes. They need to know that there are five states that provide automatic college credit in state universities for seal of biliteracy recipients. They need to know that many of these receive advanced placement that can save thousands of dollars. And you can do that by adding it to the high school website and doing other pieces to help parents and students learn early about the program. 
there are benefits to be had. These are just some of the examples from universities around the country based on average AP scores. In some cases, students with an AP score of a, of a five were earning between 10 and up to $35,000 worth of college credit. And that is a savings parents will thank you um, for certainly. A good program always needs great promotion. So it should be on the website. You can, there's posters, announcements, um, a talk about when there are testing available for a seal of biliteracy. You want to celebrate what you want to duplicate it um, and have those programs, put it out on social media. To help you do that, the Global Seal has our Global Seal of Biliteracy credential badge. And we provide the text that you need to put on your website. We also offer posters and flyers and always encourage you to share on social media. Lastly, celebrate again what you want to duplicate. Students need to know how exciting it is and what to aspire for. So in addition to the certificates which we provide to the sequels or the students completely free, that includes the embossed seals, We'll provide an additional set of embossed seals for free if you would like to put them on the diploma as well. We provide a little bit of swag at a uh, very nominal cost um, to help you make those celebrations extra special. So what's the process? You go to our website, theglobalseal.com. The step two is to apply. You click on the apply tab and apply as a group on behalf of your learners. You can apply before or after testing. When you have test scores in hand, test scores as well as a candidate sheet listing the qualifying candidates and their information would be submitted to us for verification. And then we send you free of charge your Global Seal certificates for your students. So whatever your age, if you're bilingual, get your cred. It's worth it. Thank you. Thank you.